tonight. Trump's terrorism remedy. Kenyans stand up to police violence. Why is he shooting me? And... Yes! An airstrike in northern Yemen killed at least 26 people at a hotel and busy marketplace today. Local health officials say the Saudi-led military coalition is responsible for the strike that leveled the hotel and left a huge crater. At least 10,000 people have died in Yemen's two and a half year civil war between government forces, which have Saudi Arabia's support, and the Houthis, who are backed by Iran. The war has also created a humanitarian crisis. Millions of Yemenis don't have safe food and water, and a cholera outbreak has killed nearly 2,200 people. The Navy released official findings today that two deadly collisions involving U.S. destroyer ships could have been avoided. In June, seven sailors died when the Fitzgerald collided with a container ship near Japan. And in August, 10 sailors were killed when the John S. McCain crashed into an oil tanker near Singapore. New photos published in a pair of reports show the crushing damage inside both ships. Investigators found that Fitzgerald crew members weren't familiar with basic radar fundamentals. They also found that crew members on the John S. McCain lacked basic level knowledge of the steering control system. Starting in October 2019, people will no longer be able to climb Uluru, the giant sandstone rock in the central Australian desert. Climbing Uluru, also known as Ayers Rock, has been the subject of debate for years. It's a deeply sacred site for indigenous people, and a nearby sign asks visitors not to climb. But the site is jointly managed by the Ananu people and the government, and the national park has allowed climbers to go up. An indigenous community representative, who sits on the park's board, says it's, quote, not a playground or theme park like Disneyland. The President's Commission on the Opioid Crisis released a draft of its final report today, outlining 56 recommendations to fight the epidemic. They include increasing educational requirements for prescribers and mandating that prescribers check prescription drug monitoring databases. The report also calls for a broad expansion of drug courts, which try to direct substance abusers into treatment. The six-member commission will vote to approve the draft tomorrow, but many of the recommendations will fall to Congress and local governments to fund and implement. The CIA has released nearly a half million files recovered during the 2011 raid that killed Osama bin Laden at his compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan, including his personal journal. He writes that in 1970, when he was 13, he spent two and a half months in a study abroad program living with a family in England. Bin Laden describes visiting William Shakespeare's house, which left the future terrorist leader unimpressed and convinced that the West was morally loose. One day after Saifullo Saipov killed eight people in New York City in a carefully planned truck attack, he appeared in a wheelchair in federal court to face formal terrorism charges. Responding to the attack today, President Trump proposed a novel solution, dismantling the visa process that brought Saipov here seven years ago. Diversity and diversity lottery. Diversity lottery sounds nice, it's not nice. Not good. The diversity lottery program dates to 1990. It is the most comprehensive reform of our immigration laws in 66 years. And it was designed to provide a path to legal residence for people from countries that don't send a lot of immigrants. There's no evidence that the lottery presents a particular terrorism risk, but ending it would have one benefit, the appearance of doing something. Everyone wants to stop attacks like yesterday's from happening. But the problem is that most of the immigration fixes that have come along just won't do the job. That's because stopping terrorism is much more complicated than simply singling out some bad people or bad countries and keeping them away. As every study that's examined terrorism in the US has shown, a huge part of the problem is people who were born here. Earlier this year, for example, the Department of Homeland Security looked at 82 people in the U.S. who were convicted of a terrorist act or died committing one since 2011. 
and found that less than half were immigrants. Albert Ford studies homegrown terrorism for the New America Foundation. The kicker here is that it's not about when they come to the country, it's about when and where they radicalize. How to prevent further acts of terrorism or prevent people from becoming radicalized via any political ideology is not just an immigration issue. I think in many ways it's probably a bottom-up issue. There are exceptions, of course. Terrorism comes in all stripes, including white Americans with no ties to jihadi groups at all. But even those who were foreign-born rarely came to the U.S. prepared to carry out an attack. According to DHS, the average time between arrival and radicalization is 13 years. That's why there are no quick fixes here. And so far, quick fixes are what's mostly been put forward by the Trump administration. The plan to ban refugees, for example, wouldn't have had a major impact on terrorism. According to the Cato Institute, refugees have carried out only three successful attacks in the past 40 years. That's 20 refugees gone bad out of three million. Even Trump's ban on select high-risk countries isn't based in fact. Earlier this year, DHS looked at the countries whose citizens carried out the most terror plots in the U.S. Of the top seven, only one is on the Trump administration's latest list. And it's not Uzbekistan. In Kenya, a disputed presidential contest has plunged the country into a political crisis that's turned violent at points. Confrontations between police and citizens broke out again last week when voting got underway in a repeat election. Today, a local civil rights organization said that at least 13 people died after being shot by law enforcement. President Uhuru Kenyatta won the latest vote and his party has called for calm. But the main opposition group, led by Raila Odinga, has long accused the state of using police violence to crush dissent. Vice News met with Kenyans working to document police brutality in the country's capital. Because we have street battles and street running, so you need to get rubber shoes. When you're in danger, you can run very fast. Francis Sakwa has to be cautious when he leaves his wife and three children at home in the Mathare slum and heads for Nairobi's streets. For nearly 10 years, he's been documenting acts of police brutality against protesters who oppose President Kenyatta's rule. Stop police killing! Stop police killing! Stop police killing! Stop police killing! The violence between the authorities and opposition supporters has become a fact of life here. So we are here to condemn the police act of using excessive force against unarmed civilians. You cannot justify a protester throwing stone, fighting back, using a bullet. It is not justifiable. Sakwa's work is also investigative. He and his colleagues collect physical evidence and witness testimony from police shootings. They present their findings to human rights organizations. I first had the first gunshot. Da. Second, da. the third, da. the f fourth, four. Why? When the team heard that 21-year-old Kevin Mwangi was shot to death by police, they went to investigate. So I've just picked up the cartridge which was uh, used yesterday in the shooting and uh, killing of the young Kangi, so that it can help in some of the investigation later. Cell phone videos the group collected after the presidential elections in August showed police beating citizens. <laughs> Alfred Lebo's 17-year-old brother Silas was one of them. The policeman told my mom that, mom, be quiet. We are not the one who stole in Raila's votes. We are doing our work. Police dragged the high school student out of his house, beat him unconscious, and left him in a ditch. He died of his injuries the next day. Do you see if we'll get justice? They promised that, that, that we are, they will do the justice to us so that we can see what we, we can see what happened. So we are still waiting for them. Violence at the hands of the police has played out largely in opposition strongholds, like the slums where the majority of residents share the same Luo ethnicity as candidate Raila Odinga. 
That's no accident, according to a Nairobi officer who spoke anonymously to Vice News. He told us that members of the police target and kill opposition leaders in order to keep the current government in power, and that police in turn receive kickbacks from government officials. So well, after the 8th August elections, we were going house to house, searching for the key protesters, getting them out. It's, it's, it's being eliminated by being killed. The main mission of the police is to make the Uru and the Jubilee Party to proceed in the country and the leaders of the police department to get some kickbacks by protecting him. Kenyan police did not respond to Vice News's request for comment. Government officials have repeatedly denied that protesters are targeted. The doctrine of our police service is not to attack citizens, it is to protect the citizens of this country. Sakwa has had to hide from law enforcement again and again, and he's moved repeatedly to protect his family. He's documented more than 200 instances of police brutality so far. Not less than 30 times I've been arrested by police from 208, and I've been taken to court five times. Maybe it's God's grace why they have never thought of killing me, but we fear for our life, we really fear for our life. The Senate and House Intelligence Committees held back-to-back -back hearings on Wednesday to try to figure out how Russia used social media to influence the presidential election. Both committees fired angry questions at representatives from Facebook, Google, and Twitter. This isn't about relitigating the 2016 U.S. presidential election. This is about corporate responsibility. We are not going to go away, gentlemen. And this is a very big deal and both released ads that Russian interests circulated online during the campaign. But if members are trying to win control of America's social media companies, they have a long fight ahead of them. Congress is finally opening the hood on social media. For the first time, Congress is starting to talk about what social media has done to our democracy. Companies like Google, Twitter, and Facebook that have faced Congress this week have prepared for this moment. That's according to Matt Wood, policy director of a communications watchdog group. These companies were not at all alive, you know, a decade ago or so, and they really tried to stay away from DC. Google was really the first one to have a beachhead here, and now just focusing on Google itself because it's one of the biggest ones, they are doing as much lobbying as pretty much anybody. They're in the top five or 10 and kind of rocketing up the charts as they get up to the same level where we've seen companies like AT&T and Comcast for decades now. Google started lobbying in 2003. It spent $80,000 on it that year. This year, it spent more than $13 million and counting on lobbying. In 2009, it was news when Facebook hired lobbyists. The company spent around $200,000 on lobbying Congress and federal agencies that year. So far this year, they spent more than 8.4 million. Twitter's the newest on the scene. It first started lobbying DC in 2013, the tune of around 90 grand. Already this year, the company has spent around $400,000. So what do they want? What are they buying with all this largesse? Mostly what they want is to be left alone. And I say that because that's really their main play in DC. It's still very defensive. It's like, stay away, don't get into our search business, don't get into our algorithms. Google, Facebook, Apple especially, uh, all in their own ways, want to stay out of the picture and stay out of the story, but still have the result obviously benefiting them at the end of the day. These are the disruptor companies in the big economy. But when it comes to the economy of Washington influence, they're old school. They use the same lobbyists and the same tactics that a company like GE would. The Silicon Valley companies are stereotyped and portrayed as more democratic leaning, and that's probably fair, but they all hit both sides and they have lobbyists who work both sides of the aisle, oftentimes in the same company or in the same lobbying firm. Of the 15 members of the Senate Intelligence Committee, Facebook donated to 11 of them during the 2016 election cycle. So members of Congress are finally getting around to giving social media a close look just as social media companies are finally getting around to spending the most on Washington influence they've ever spent. Neat trick, huh? Okay. 
Get you in. All right, I'll let you know what we do. It's lot number one, a history-making lot, 2,900 GTPI, 1,000 in net merit. It's never been sold before. Wow, here we go. Now we ought to be somewhere around 200,000 to go up the hill. In a private suite overlooking the largest football stadium in the country, dairy farmers are casually dropping tens of thousands of dollars on cows they've only seen in a brochure. Think about it. I don't think too long. we we got to move. But I'm asking 155000 for a quarter of a million dollar heifer. 155 will get you in. These are some of the most genetically elite cows in the country. They have perfect udders, pristine lineages, and really high genetic scores. Almost half of the cows for sale today were raised by the auction's host, Jerry Jorgensen, a 29-year-old farmer from Michigan. 230, 235,000. What kind of cigar is he smoking? <laughs> 235, we're going to move. Sold it, $230,000. Hey, girls. Nothing about fourth-generation farmer Jerry screams, I raise super cows. But he's basically been breeding genetically elite cows since he was a teenager. Back then, it was just a side hustle on his father's farm. Now, he handles the family's entire breeding program. But these are, these are healthy-looking cows to you. Yeah. So, yeah, just the ones that are up and alert and ears up. How much have you grown the business? The genetic program has went from having three to five calves born a year to a thousand. Do you know roughly how much on average you would like to get per cow or how it works out? The average animal sold for $20,000. One of the reasons I don't like to talk numbers is because people don't understand the inputs. Um, but you're not turning a huge profit on a cow, even if you're selling it for $20,000 or more. When an animal sold for a large dollar amount, it's not all profit. If you can make a profit just like that, everybody would be doing it. Selective breeding used to be much more romantic. Farmers would put two of their favorite cows in a pen together and hope for the best. Today, thanks to advances in DNA testing, breeding cows is more like drafting fantasy football players. With a few hairs and about 50 bucks, you can get something called a Genomic Total Performance Index, or GTPI number, for each cow which includes all kinds of crucial stats, like how much milk it'll produce, how much fat will be in that milk, and how long and fertile its life will be. Get a high score, and you could make the Holstein Association's list of this month's top new dairy cows. So every animal here has a genomic profile. Any cow here, I can look her up and say, okay, here's what she is. Here's the likelihood of her being able to make an elite animal. How many cows are there on the farm, and how many of them are elite animals, or what you would consider elite animals? Uh, Right now we're milking 300 cows, and there's uh, five milking that we consider elite, or the pool of elite donors that we would uh, take embryos from. Jerry's being modest. There are no duds on his farm. He says his entire herd ranks in the top 3% of cows in the country. But his female cows are divided into two groups, the super elite whose eggs are used for fertilization, and the regular elite whose bodies are used to carry the fertilized embryos. It's like a bovine spin-off of The Handmaid's Tale. To maximize the chances of birthing more super elite cows, Jerry follows a precise system. The ones he already has are given hormones so they release more eggs, then artificially inseminated using super elite semen bought from top bull sperm banks. When embryos form, they're flushed out, inspected under a microscope, and then implanted into different cows. Top dairy farmers used to be able to get maybe one calf from their best cow each year. Jerry can get 10 calves from each of his best cows every month. It's a little like speeding up cow evolution every 30 days, which sounds weird, but is actually something the dairy industry has been doing for decades, just more gradually. If you look at just simple how much milk can an average cow produce over time, 
that line is just a straight upward sloping line since about World War II. Andrew Novakovich is an agricultural economist at Cornell who's been studying the dairy industry since the 1970s. Even though the U.S. has fewer cows than it did back then, the country still produces a lot more milk. It's a huge difference. It's, uh, it's enormous. Uh, we've improved feeding. We've improved uh, health care. We've improved comfort of the animal in her stall, in the barn, walking around in the pastures. But the key is the genetic potential of the animal. Are there any negative aspects to selectively breeding a species like, like cows? Well, you know, different people, of course, will evaluate that based on their own sense of values of what's right and wrong. But I would say, other than the fact that you're not having a bull physically mating with a cow, everything else about this is pretty natural. You could ask yourself the question, do I want to produce 200 billion pounds of milk with 10 million cows or 20 million cows? And which is going to have the larger environmental impact? And it's pretty obvious that these increases in productivity, uh, I would say, are highly favorable towards uh, sustainability goals. Jerry doesn't spend a lot of his time thinking about the environmental impact of today's dairy industry. He barely has time to check how he did when the new cow scores come in each week. Here's how, this is the, how fast I look at them. Okay, okay, no, no, nope, nope. Where do you see the scores? So this is our TPI right here. 26.17. Yeah, which isn't good. That's not good? Well, it's, because it'll still be like 98, 99 percentile. But, but for, it won't be a future donor. Like this one is a recipient. She'll carry an embryo 100%. It's not like a secret recipe. I mean, I'm picking traits that everybody else can see, mating them to other traits that are also readily available for everybody, and then breeding them to where I think I can create a genetically superior cow. Do you consider yourself a dairy farmer? Uh, yes. I mean, I still do a lot of what I consider dairy farming, whether it's feeding cows or working with animals. Have you ever considered adding, like, and scientist at the end of, of your title. <laughs> I haven't, but that'd be pretty interesting. Yesterday, Donald Trump Jr. tweeted this world-class metaphor, saying he was going to take half of his daughter Chloe's candy and give it to another child who stayed home to teach Chloe about socialism. The internet reacted swiftly to Trump Jr.'s remark about trick-or-treating, the age-old capitalist tradition of children earning candy like door-to-door -door salesmen from the 1950s. While some of the internet was quick to jump on Trump Jr.'s inability to write the correct two, many others honed in on Trump Jr.'s use of the term socialism to describe taking half of his daughter's candy away. So, is socialism the most appropriate term to describe taking candy that your daughter received for free and giving it to someone else who hasn't done anything to earn that candy? Well, can't believe we're doing this, but let's dive in with this day after Halloween discount candy. If Chloe decides to hoard the candy, open a stall a few days later in order to sell the candy she has to the child at home for a profit, that's capitalism. If Chloe got a lot of candy, but the state has decreed that everyone is only allowed five pieces per person, including that child at home, that's communism. If Chloe is only allowed to get candy from the state if and when she's allowed to, unless the state has decreed that all candy is illegal, then that's fascism. And if Chloe is able to own candy as much as everyone else is able to own candy because everyone owns it together, that's socialism. Bear in mind, none of this accounts for the health care that would be needed after contracting early onset diabetes or the tax rate that would be applied to Chloe's, let's be honest, what looks to be a fairly disappointing candy stash. But just because this attempt at a candy metaphor was ill thought out, just like Don Jr's last attempt, I, for one, am looking forward to the next one. Third time's a charm. Charm. That's Vice News Tonight for Wednesday, November 1st. 